Hi, I'm F. Paul Driscoll, Editor-in-Chief of Opera News, and welcome to the latest episode of Sightlines, our new video interview series. My guest today is Troy Schumacher, who is a dancer and choreographer. He is a soloist with New York City Ballet and is also the director of Ballet Collective and has a very exciting new project with that company, which he's working on now, and he joins us before he has his first rehearsal of the day whatever time you people are watching. It's now nine o'clock in the morning. I don't know about for um, Troy, but it's kind of early for me. But <laughs> forgive me if I look a little bit wrinkled. Uh -huh. So it's nutcracker season and most theaters are not showing nutcracker. Those companies, including New York City Ballet, which have made an annual tradition. However, you've found a way to bring the nutcracker alive. And talk to me about that at Weathersfield. Right. I, it's So the Nutcracker, it's such an important tradition for New York, for ballet dancers, and for families. And most importantly for our art form, it's a very important um, link between people and ballet. And for example, I just remembered yesterday that I started doing ballet because I was performing in a Nutcracker and how mm -hmm. important this production is and how, you know, dancers, we always joke about how sick of it we are, or we hate it, but we all deep down really love this production and we love the score and we love the communal aspect of being a part of the Nutcracker. So all of that being said, as the season started changing, you know, I was getting a little um, uh, distraught about what was going to occur for people when socially distanced walks weren't really possible anymore and the opera was still closed and the ballet was still closed and Broadway still closed and how can as a small organization us try to find ways to get people back to work and also try to provide you know whatever we can within you know regulations to create something new and special that maybe would be amazing any year, but really only possible because of all of the horrible things that we are all going through right now in the world. Mm -hmm. So where are you performing? Where are you going to do this event? So we, I was brought to this historic estate up in the Hudson Valley in mid-September. And my wife and I, we were still up here because with Ballet Collective, we actually created and performed the first full ballet live since the start of the pandemic up in Pine Plains, which is about a 15 minute drive from um, Millbrook. And mm -hmm. I was brought to these gardens under the auspices of presenting an outdoor socially distanced performance next summer, just like really looking ahead mm -hmm. in the sense that like this might very well still be going on and outdoor performances might be the really only you know, safe pathway forward to do anything really at a scale. And at the end of this tour, through these, you know, gorgeous topiaries and flowers and sweeping vistas of the Hudson Valley, I was brought into the house, which is a late 30s Georgian style mansion uh, that was built by one of the founders of a bank that became um, Citibank. And I went inside the house and I thought, just, is this the set of the Nutcracker? Like, is this, huh. like, how, is this something that could be done? Like, what what are the challenges of creating a Nutcracker? And I think you've seen some of my work, you know, that's not generally okay. the direction that I go for anything. No. Uh, but I was thinking about how do we, like, this is a way, this is a catalyst to both maybe do a really interesting, um, you know, exploration of how the Nutcracker could be presented and also most importantly, get 
a large group of people back to work right now and not just get them compensation, but give them a purpose and give them an outlet. When especially ballet dancers have been giving themselves ballet class in their kitchens for 10 months, right? <laughs> now. It's bleak. I mean, it's really hard. It's not, it's not a satisfying way to go. Um, the way that I think a lot of other art forms have been able to, you know, you can really still keep your craft up and still, you know, if you're a musician, the way that you know, the opera and classical music and jazz organizations have been able to really work via Zoom. Dancers, especially ballet, it's like, we need 1,200 square feet. Sure. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's really important to find opportunities to get people together. And so when I had this initial idea of like, can we do something in and surrounding this house with all this space and these gardens and these large rooms? I just, I just not, I, you know, I just whispered a little inkling of it to the trustee who was taking me through the, the house at the moment. And then I told my wife, we talked about it. And that night I just woke up at 2 AM and I was just like, all right, how do I solve this problem? How do I solve this problem? Both like from a narrative, from a safety perspective, and just to see if all of this could even be really viable. So your dancers are all City Ballet members? It's, so it's 22 mem of my current colleagues from New York City Ballet. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the dancers is uh, married to a former ABG dancer who mm -hmm. has now pivoted into acting, who is playing our Drosselmeyer. Oh, how nice. And, yeah, and also uh, Jared Engel, um, who is the principal at New York City Ballet, he's uh, our company manager right now. <laughs> so, uh -huh. uh, you know, finding different ways for people to uh, participate in this, but we're also engaging uh, some of my colleagues from New York City Valley in stage management and lighting and wardrobe and elements like that. So we're really, um, not to mention all the local tech people in the Hudson Valley that we're bringing, you know, opportunities to work again to as well. So this event, the Nutcracker event, you're, you're changing it a little bit. I believe that you've made some cuts in the national dances and you're not going to have children the way most performances. Um, correct. Yeah. So in trying to create something new um, out of this, which is, I think, such a daunting task, especially when you've been performing one version of this. I mean, thankfully, it's not the only version that I've participated mm -hmm. in, but, what, but it's pretty deep in there. And yeah. right now, I think in some ways, it's a really hard um, concept to reinvent, to try to put your own very unique spin on. Um, but right now, I don't think that that's what anybody's really wanting. I think that yeah. what people want right now, you know, people want artists to go out there and digest everything that's happened in their lives and the world at large. And that's a really important thing that I think artists are being deprived of right now. But I also yeah. think people just want like some semblance of normalcy, some sort of magic looking back into the past and really like cl classical art forms that have not been able to, that rely upon this infrastructure are really what I think would be incredibly satisfying right now. Like we've all seen, you know, plenty of solos and duos and sneakers yeah. outdoors right now. And how do we bring back a real, a really strong classical tradition using kind of like a roving infrastructure space. And so, thinking about the Nutcracker from like a directorial standpoint and what the story is, um, which most of the story happens in the first act, which is the party scene. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really a, a domestic story. It's a story about a father, a mother, a daughter, a son, and an uncle. Mm -hmm. That's really where all the story comes from. Everybody else on stage is not just ambiance, right? And filling the music up and adding to, you know, a larger picture in an opera house environment. So initially I was just like, oh, so if people just walked in and found themselves as guests in the party scene, all the action could proceed from there. Mm -hmm. 
while at the same time coming up with a very, very specific socially distanced travel plan for people. Because when you look at the science behind um, COVID transmission, right, it's mm -hmm. about um, aerosolization, uh, time of exposure, and um, distance, right? So those are the three main thing and masks, obviously, yeah. um, that need to be um, worn. So um, what we created is this, a way that we can move people around the space that they're never coming into contact. So the idea that I had and that we've been working with doctors about is having these pods within the event. So a family or a group that are a member of the same pod, which would arrive, the doors of the house would open and they'd be like, oh, uh, this, is, this is a party for, for us that we're at. And then as they move through this entire event, they never come within six feet of another family. So this family is not socially distanced from one another because they don't need to because they live together. This people, it's like they're going around like this. Uh -huh. And so they never cross paths throughout the entire experience but they all receive the entire narrative at the same time. So in some ways it's, it's an immersive theater experience where you're a part of it, but it's not, it's not like wander wherever you want to. It's a, very, mm -hmm. it's a very close guided environment. So with all of that, it's like you have the main characters that are sharing this narrative. And so you meet the family, you meet the children, you meet the eccentric uncle, he brings some dolls to life, they dance, he presents the nutcracker, the little boy steals the nutcracker, runs into this other room, right? So we're like having people travel from room to room, so they're never in one place for too long, mm -hmm. right? And the rooms are, you know, ventilated anyway, but just to be extra careful. So he goes into this other room, which is this <laughs> kind of ridiculous, space that like who has this of their house but it's like this like 20 foot high ceiling frescoed gilded room with like renaissance painting and classical sculpture in it and um and that's where the the little boy breaks the nutcracker the uncle comes and fixes it kind of like puts a little bit of a spell on it and then the party ends so that's this entire journey that people have and so i'm explaining all of this because this is really where the largest shift is occurring um, in this story is that like for me and what I think will be a very valuable experience for people is if it becomes their story, for example, okay. right? So like this is your story. You're coming to this party. This kind of weird stuff happens. There's a family fight and then the party ends prematurely. And then a stage manager leads you out onto a terrace and there are several large, there are eight large double wide windows abutting the house on this terrace. And through a window, you actually watch the house go to sleep. And then you watch the little girl sneak around the house looking for the nutcracker. She finds it, she curls up on a couch. And then all of a sudden the mice, you just, from almost a voyeuristic perspective, are watching this, these mice scurrying across the house. The little girl wakes up, they chase her around the house. The nutcracker springs to life scares the mice out of one room. They continue chasing them. They almost get the little girl again. He scares the mice out of the house. And then lights turn on behind you, boom. And the Mouse King is actually out on the terrace waving his sword at you. Oh. And so like that, it, it shifts from being this family story to being like you are now being threatened. And then the mm -hmm. Nutcracker opens up a window of the house, runs out onto the terrace, battles the Mouse King, and then leads you on this journey into the winter wonderland and then into the land of sweets. So it becomes like you are being saved by the Nutcracker. You are going into, you know, the pines and then into the land of sweets. And so you sit at a table and with covered with fake design confections. And that's your, you're sitting on that throne it's not the little girl and the prince sitting on that throne. It's like you having mm -hmm. that really special um, moment, which also allows us to um, put a little bit of a spin on 
this land of sweets because it's um, in the round, actually. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different way of trying to choreograph within a classical style. So the music, I'm assuming, is recorded. Yes, it's recorded um, for so many reasons. Uh, right. As I just mentioned, there's about seven different locations mm -hmm. that, um, uh, that this occurs in. However, there is, for select audience members, a special um, moment that's going to be provided by the Metropolis Ensemble by a mm -hmm. single um, violinist um, yeah. who will, um, you know, there'll be kind of like a, a secret recital that they, that takes place during one part of the event. So there will be a live music component, but, you know, with um, occupancy guidelines and all of those restrictions that we're all following for this, it, getting an orchestra in there um, yeah. would be, would be a challenge um, to say the least. And, you know, I did want to at least try to have there be like slightly more invited people than um, dancers. You know, it, that ratio has to be, you know, even, but we are keeping this, it's an incredibly small, um, you know, distance, but intimate event for people. Now, the first iteration of the event is December 4th. Mm -hmm. And how much, how long have you all been at Weathersfield uh, rehearsing this? Right. So, I mean, the craziest thing about this is that I was brought to the estate, I think, September 16th. And I thought, wow. oh my gosh. I was like, that, that's 12 weeks until we would need to, you know, potentially f almost finish this create, the whole creative process. And I hadn't even started producing this yet. And so I was like, okay, so 12 months of work or 18 months of work in 12 weeks, like, mm -hmm. can I do this? Mm -hmm. um, and knowing with all of that, just being that like, are, if numbers are going to rise, is this like a, the, the risk worth taking to try to you know, do something a little out there and a little, um, you know, with that chance that like this might crash and burn um, mm -hmm. because of what is happening around us. But like, how do we try to do something in the safest way possible, having to try to raise, you know, a lot of money and then also trying to create an entirely new, if, you know, slightly reduced version of the Nutcracker in which we have basically extremely, extremely limited rehearsal time. So I've been wearing a lot of hats with this, but the dancers, this is just their um, sixth day up here. So we did, a, we did some Zoom rehearsals and we also, yeah, so we're just working. Like I'm just working morning till night on this. And I was so, you know, drowning in admin for so long on this. And then I was able to, I still have a lot, but I was able to tie a little bit up so that I can just be, you know, I can put my phone on do not disturb when I get into the studio. And then I can yeah. just like go and do really what I love to do the most. So I'm so exhausted right now. That's like the best type of exhaustion because I know I'm doing something that is so worthwhile and so meaningful to all these people involved. So normally you would spend like 12 weeks in the studio doing something like this, but I think what's really helping is like working within this classical ballet vernacular and not trying to be like, you know, it's entirely original and it's not copying anything, um, but it's not like, I'm not doing, I'm not transporting the Nutcracker into a different time and place. Right. Um, will you have costumes or, I mean, period costumes? Um, so what we're doing is we're going from almost like a timeless classic for the party. Uh -huh. And then it gets kind of like a little weird. And then it gets very traditional. Mm -hmm. So what's quite wonderful is um, Oscar de la Renta and Todd Snyder are dressing the family in the party scene. So mm -hmm. they're going to just look very, just like beautifully elegant, very much of the house. Like they should just like people could live in this house either today or 70 years ago. 
Um, and then, you know, the mice costumes are um, a little, uh, you know, silly. Um, and then one of the things that was trying to figure out, like, what differentiates this production as if it's not really different enough, you know, Weathersfield is most famous for its gardens. And uh -huh. you think of all these productions of Nutcracker with the beautiful snowy pines in the background. And I was like, how do I convince five of my female colleagues to do a snow ballet through this garden? And <laughs> So really what that involves is um, snowboarding suits with romantic tutus on the outside of them and fur hats and mittens um, and, and basically like little snow boots. So this, that's the biggest kind of departure that we're, we're doing in this whole production is this whole like, um, how do you do an outdoor snow ballet for the snow scene before we really pivot into like classical ballet tutus? I mean, snow ballet has a tutu, but like something that, in the land of sweets, it's very much like, you know, tutus and dresses and point shoes and all of that. But just to do something that's a little, um, just special and fabulous and, you know, obviously very weather dependent, but also right. there's only, um, we can only invite eight families each time we do this event. So if something occurs, that's much, much easier um, challenge than trying to reschedule a 2,000 person right. proceeding theater event. When you say eight families as guests, what's the maximum number, about 30? Yes, or 32. Uh -huh. 32 guests per event, and there are um, 20, around 20, um, three, 22 dancers. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's never more than um, 50 people in one place at any time. And the house, um, the way the regulations are, is historical sites need to be kept at 25% capacity. So we're doing that. And then we're actually making you know, the tent is really a tent for, like, I think it's something like 400 people. And so it's going to be at like 12% capacity um so we're just keeping it very you know like trying to like do more safety because the we've in trying to create this it's you know safety is really the most important thing because of its implications for the art form for everybody's health you know that's that's really what what we have to really be working around right now so in what year could you you know pitch to potential funders being like, okay, so we're going to do a, a free invitation only brand new production of the Nutcracker where only eight families can attend it at a time. Like it's a, it's preposterous, right? Like any other year, 2019, 18, whatever. Like yeah. the only time that that wasn't preposterous is like, you know, early, early 20th century going backwards. Right. Uh, yeah. But right now it's like, people understand it's the only way that we can do this. And so that's been, you know, a lot of people have come along and the way we're doing this, especially it's not, um, it's the budget is about like the 10th of the cost of a normal production of the mm -hmm. Nutcracker because we have the set because it's a historic site yeah. and the gardens. Um, so it's been, you know, that part of it, um, yeah. So <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot. It's such a complicated endeavor, but it's so, it's so, um, it's all kind of like there, if that makes sense. And that's why I was like, yeah. every time I kind of like questioned, like, is this worth doing? It was just like, the answer was always yes, because it was just like, it's so, it's so perfect. So how many times will this event be repeated at Weathersfield? How many so, shows? So we have, um, it's a little, it's actually quite fluid right mm -hmm. now. Um, so, you know, how this is really working is the show is being underwritten um, by patrons, by private donors. Mm -hmm. um, and that underwriting goes towards us 
creating this and coming up together and working again and taking class every day and rehearsing and living together and quarantining together and getting tested and just being very safe. Um, and as a, and then we're inviting those people to come see what they helped to create. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, we are donating um, approximately uh, 30 to 40 percent of the events to local nonprofits that serve uh, families and children uh, very hard hit by the pandemic and who are maybe having a hard time before you mm -hmm. know this this year happened. So it's really only you know it's really serving two main groups of people right now: the people who normally make the art happen because um, mm -hmm. we all know ticket sales do not cover classical art forms costs by any means in any time um, and then the people who potentially really need it the most um, unfortunately numbers case numbers um, have only gone up since we started planning this and it, it did seem from a couple New York Times articles that the government was considering opening up um, ticketed, non-traditional, socially distanced events that had, um, you know, compo different components in them, mm -hmm. um, you know, at the Shed or the Armory and places like that. But it really, you know, there were, were not any examples of large organizations outside of New York City that were mm -hmm. trying to get this. Um, and so right now we, we cannot open this up to the public for ticket for ticket sales by any means, which is really the largest disappointment for us um, mm -hmm. in trying to put this on because there's so many people that we would just love to share this with and so many people that we think would, this would really you know, improve their holiday season and give them something. And, but it's right now, it's just like, we have to you know, follow all the guidelines however we can sure. and rely upon the generosity. So all of that being said, to answer your question, it's like, it doesn't, um, the way this is all set up, it's like, it doesn't cost us anything to do events. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if we need to do 16, if we need to do 23, like we can, it, it's just all reliant upon what it takes for us to, um, you know, fund this on the front end, how many events we can, you know, give away to underserved members of the local community. And then also just holding some back if something were to change. I mean, movie theaters are still open up here. Um, so who knows, but we just have to, you know, we're not going to violate our, you know, justification for doing this as of Do right now. Do you have any plans to record it? Um, so we are, yeah, I mean, we do. And so, I mean, right now somebody is making a documentary film about this process, mm -hmm. uh, because it's just such a unique thing, oh, yeah. especially the one thing I didn't mention is that 17 of the dancers are actually living upstairs in the mansion mm -hmm. right now, um, which, uh, has both a family wing and then also like a servant's wing uh -huh. with all of these like very cute Downton Abbey, uh, type bedrooms um, with, you know, the, the wrought iron beds, single beds in them. And so it's just a really kind of unique process. And we've been talking with various, um, there are a lot of, there was a lot of interest of producing, um, uh, you know, something full for this, for the 2020 holiday season, but really the, the timeline for a lot of distributors, it's just, it's just way too tight um, because of the complexity of what we're doing with, the event over the course of an hour taking place in seven to eight different locations that there's sure. some journey. So we're going to do something um, because that's really our public facing component. And we are, you know, taking something each step of the way right now, but we have built out a page on our website, nutcracker at weathersfield.com slash stream, which is where we will um, have all of that information updated. We're talking with you know, some different potential distributors for this, but also, you know, there's a different, lots of different economies of scale that we could put something like this on. Um, but the likelihood of making it completely live would be, you know, we would need like an, a network to step in 
to do that because it's, I mean, you need so many cameras, but we're exploring like a, a hybrid model um, where we all, um, you know, where maybe the second act is live, but the first act is pre-recorded type of thing so that we yeah. can just not, it won't be too, um, too unbelievably stressful to pull that off because we're also um, on a hill in the Hudson Valley, um, you know, where there's some, where they've like petitioned to keep as many cell towers um, out of there as possible. So, you know, reception is something that we you know need to factor in as well. So whatever we send out will be at the very least very fresh, um, <laughs> if not um, fully, fully live just to account for any sort of um, issues. Well, that's all we've got time for, I think. But thank you so, so much for beginning your day with us. And I wish you I all have, success with this. I have um, one-year-old twin girls right now. So this is, uh, I've been up for a couple hours already. So <laughs> I meant your professional day, not your dad day. Because <laughs> I know yeah. that that's 24-7. But thank yeah. you so much and all, all success to you and to Ashley with this project. It's so exciting. Thank you, Ash. It's, um, it's so wonderful to speak with you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye.